to everyone. The South Asia Center at LSE was uh, started this June, on the 1st of June, to serve as LSE's platform for a school-wide thematic uh, issues of academic research across all departments, and also externally to serve as a link between academ ac academic expertise at LSE um, with important and emerging issues of debate and discussion in the South Asia region. LSE has had a very long and significant relationship with that part of the world. And therefore, it gives me great pleasure to invite this evening on stage two of our most distinguished associates, <coughs> uh, members of this community, who symbolize this historical, historic relationship between uh, South Asia and LSE. Professor Lord Nick Stern, who is going to be in conversation with Professor Sen, is widely known by many outside the discipline of economics for his 2006 Stern report on the economics of climate change. He's the first holder of the IG Patel chair at LSE uh, since 2007, and he's chair of LSE's Grantham Institute, Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment. He's currently president of the British Academy. He taught at LSE from 1986 to 1993 before going on to becoming the chief economist at EBRD and then chief economist at the World Bank from 2000 to 2003. In India, his longitudinal studies on Palanpur is one that many, many students know and read avidly. Now, Professor Amartya Sen uh, will be in conversation this evening with Nick about his new book, The Country of First Boys and Other Essays. Amartya Sen, of course, doesn't need an introduction. I introducing him is like introducing a rock star to the concert. <laughs> you have queued for hours, braved the rains, left work early, shut your books in the library, and, and come here tonight, so you know why you're here. I just thought I would uh, tell members of the audience why uh, Professor Sen is such a valued member of the LSE community. He was professor of economics here in LSE between 1972 and 1977. After moving to Harvard in the mid-1980s, he was a casual visitor to Stickard for more than 10 years, where in particular he continued his collaborations with Jean Dres, uh, which writings that many of you will know. Many of his students have gone on to become distinguished economists themselves, and I'll name just two linked to LSE, Professor Tim Besley, who is um, Arthur Lewis Professor of Development Economics here, and Kaushik Basu, who's the chief economist at the World Bank at the moment, whose predecessor, of course, Nick was. He gave the first, that's Professor Sen, gave the first Morishima lecture organized by Stickard, and before that first lecture, he garlanded the bust of Dr. Ambedkar, an illustrious alum of uh, this school, of this institution, and whose 125th birth anniversary, the South Asia Center is involved in celebrating on an exchange visit by research students visiting LSE uh, during the course of October and November. We hold an annual Amartya Sen lecture at LSE to recognize his long-term association with the school. And as of today, I hear that there is a new Amartya Sen Student Society in formation and their students have been, and their members have been in touch with uh, Professor Sen earlier today. So with those words, let me welcome Nick to take over and, and uh, there will be about uh, 45 minutes of conversation between the two great men and then uh, 45 minutes of Q&A. Thank you. Um, Amartya, uh, there are five themes. I don't know if we'll get through them because we've got to leave space for at least half the time for questions from the audience. But the five themes that I wanted to talk about, which are themes that you talk about, they're, they're not my themes, they're in a sense your themes. The notions of identity and who we are, and of course lots of aspects to that, and what difference it makes. This isn't just an idle chat about identity, it makes an enormous difference to, uh, to many things. 
The second is a, a set of questions around what should guide us and drive us when we think about what's good and bad, when we think about uh, policy, notions of justice, freedom, development, and so on. The third thing is how ideas change, how we interact, how we talk to each other. And you've been a great advocate, indeed practitioner, of, um, of public reason, public reasoning. You've spoken about the role of the press and uh, celebrated it and rued it often uh, in equal measure. And you've spoken about the, uh, the role of humour. You're obviously a fan of Jerry Rubin's. And um, that's, that's the third thing. The fourth thing is uh, the, the role of growth and the role of human development in different aspects of policy and how we should think about policy and how we should make policy. And the final thing is um, a little bit about your own identity. And uh, there's an extraordinarily privileged background, if I may say so, in the schooling in Shantinikatan and the relationship with... Not in wealth. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, 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 was I was lucky with education. <laughs> I was being explicit about the privilege. And uh, in the relationship with Tagore and so on, the, yeah. the fact that you learnt Sanskrit very early, yeah. and uh, that's rather special in, in, in the shaping uh, of a person, it must be. And, uh, but it's you that should speak about that. And, uh, so these are the things. So let's, uh, I don't know if we get through them all, but... Uh, that's the, all of these, I should say, arise from this wonderful book, The Country of First Boys, which you'll get a chance to buy. If you haven't already bought it, you'll get a chance to buy it. And you can uh, have it signed, but you, you won't have time to have an essay on the front page about Amartya's relationship with you, it, <laughs> or his answer to the question you might have asked if you'd got the chance. Um, it will be a fairly rapid signing for uh, good reasons of... Um, uh, equity with the person behind you in the uh, <laughs> in the queue. So, uh, but it's this book. It's it's a book of essays, a uh, book of thirteen essays over about uh, fifteen years, and it's edited by Antara Devsen <coughs> and uh, Pratik Kanjilal, who I don't know if I'm allowed to say is your daughter and son-in-law, um, and uh, uh, very all, all in the family. All in the family. <laughs> <laughs> and it is dedicated to school teachers and health workers, I thought underneath you were going to put brackets, at least the ones who show up. But the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's the book. It's very special and uh, you should buy it. And uh, I spent the whole of the last Sunday with it and uh, enjoyed it uh, enormously. So if we could start, Amartya, with um, identity. Uh, you've written a lot about how people are, uh, are many things. Um, you know, they can be Gardener and nuclear physicist and football fan and uh, Christian and Malaysian and they're all these things and they're all all important. So to classify people just as one thing is dangerous. But then of course you point out that that's very often what we do do, and what uh, happens. But there's another sense, and you speak also um, about uh, weakness of will, and. Um, Many of you will have read Danny Kahneman's book, uh, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, where you resolve on December 31st not to eat a donut next year, and then on January the 12th, a donut goes past uh, in front of you, and uh, you know, the former is thinking slow and the latter is thinking fast. Uh, you talk about weakness of uh, will and emphasize that this is a concept that uh, goes way, way back, millennia back in, in you talk, talk about the gambler <coughs> and the weakness of will. So, Marcia, could you tell us something about why you think multiple identities are so important in the first sense of the term, and whether you think that actually multiple identities is a reasonable way to describe weakness of will, or whether that is actually, it's not true there's a lower self and a higher self, or the one who thinks fast and one thinks slow, that actually it's more complex than that. So there are two questions, at least two questions there. Two questions. At least two, yeah. yeah. Um, well, I think multiple identity is important for uh, three quite different reasons. One is that if you're describing something, uh, to think that they, I mean, you're always, a, any act of description is an act of choice. But if you choose just one identity, you may actually misdescribe a person, you know, and it's happened a lot in the context of, uh, you know, uh, religious differences. 
Uh, one example would be Islamophobia. You identify someone as Islam. But it would be like saying the bomb on Hiroshima was dropped by a Christian. Two. Mm. It's true, yeah. Yeah. On the other hand, that's not the most obvious description of it, not by an American Air Force guy who thought that there was, you know, there was his command. The American thinking was that they would shorten the war. May not have justified it, my judgment did not. But the description that makes a difference. So if you want to know something about a person, you want to know something about it. And that's why I'm also, even though I've spent a certain amount of time in my life helping friends to do index, like Mabu Wul Haq and the Human Development Index, I'm always very critical of that. I mean, if I want to know about, say, Kazakhstan, I, what I'm looking for is what the country is like, what the food is like, and what the inequality is like, how free are the women, and all that, rather than an answer like 138, <laughs> which would not communicate very much <laughs> anything to me. So it's very important descriptively to take in mind the multiple identity of a person. Secondly, to recognize that uh, you can fairly easily inflame a population into violence by playing up one identity and exclude everything else. And uh, that happened in my childhood. I was, you know, as an Indian, uh, I was being schooled in British India. And, uh, and in Bengal, where I come from, the Hindu-Muslim division had never been very strong. Not that there had never been a problem there. But basically not. I mean, even when Robert Clive conquered Bengal, that's how the empire began, uh, he's writing a letter to Sirazola, the emperor, saying, um, uh, I mean, I don't mean any, do anything terrible to you. He's actually marching with his army towards his capital uh, uh, in Mushidabad. On the way is Plassey, where the battle is fought. So he's trying to mislead the emperor. That's not my point there. The, the perfidy with which the British Empire was created is a subject for discussion, which may take up on another occasion. But when he is saying to the emperor, uh, to the king, Shiradullah saying, why don't you consult your closest friends? And they will tell you that I'm a good man and actually want to friendship with you. And there he lists who which these people are. So he lists seven people at the closest circle, four of whom of this Muslim king, four of whom are Hindus, and three Muslims. And uh, that's not a distinction. As it turned out, the two persons who ultimately fought with Sirad and died were in fact the Hindus. And, and so that was never a, a big problem. But suddenly, with the politics of partition, it became the huge thing. And I remember first suddenly the big riots coming up in uh, you know city like Dhaka and so on. Now there's a certain amount of violence going on, but it's Islamic extremism now, whereby vloggers are killed. But that's not the way a Bangladeshi tend to think. They, that's not a big distinction, even though Hindu are a tiny minority. And uh, and but that sort of disappeared because suddenly they ha who had taught themselves that Bengali or Indian suddenly we're thinking as finely defined Hindus or finely defined characterized Muslims, and we don't like each other, quote unquote. The country, the first time the Muslim League won in the election was 46. The country became partitioned in 47. Mm -hmm. And in six years' time, there will be a Bengali movement, the identity <coughs> of Bengali identity coming up very strongly. And now, but in between, lots of people got killed. The estimate of a million is probably too much, but certainly hundreds of thousands got killed in that, in that battle. Now, it can easily be inflamed like that, and it's at the moment being inflamed on both sides, yeah. in the, on the Islamic uh, State side, as well as the anti, uh, the opposite side, playing up as if something suspicious on the part of, 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 uh, of, of Muslims generally. It's important to remember that the First World War was similarly inflamed by another war in which, uh, you know, uh, uh, identity wasn't a religious difference, it's a national identity, British, German, French, 
that divided. It didn't, the religion didn't matter. So two different parts of the same person's identity, Christian, uh, um, British. In one case, the Christianity may be emphasized, in another case, British. But each could be a source of information, and the others. Yeah. Race could be another one. Uh, and, and these... And, and in, the, in the Europe built um, after the Second World War, there was a very deliberate attempt to um, bring to the front uh, a European dimension. Yes, and the so, European, so that we and the European identity was emphasized. That was part of the story of the European movement. And if identity, identity is very common, co very, very complex, let me also boast saying that even though I'm not European, mm -hmm. the European movement original signatory done by three people in the prison in Vintotene uh, in 1942. That was uh, 41, I think. And that uh, declaration, uh, they were all members of my family. In this in my late wife, whom you knew, yes. Eva. One was her Eva father, Colony, yeah. who was killed by, she was in the resistance, he was ultimately killed by Mussolini, by the fascist. The other was my stepfather-in-law. So one was Eva's father, my father-in-law. Another was my stepfather-in-law. And there was one, Chap Ernesto Rossi outside the family, but everybody else was within the family. But do you, would you worry that around the world we might be deteriorating in the? No, but I think no, we are not deteriorating over time, but uh, from time to time. In the sense of ascribing identities yeah, in a rather and the, narrow the, way. Uh, it, it is important. I mean, even in the context of my thinking about identity. I mean, when I first came to Britain as a student in Cambridge, though I used to hang around the LSE a lot. Uh, you know, Cambridge is a small town, <laughs> and <laughs> London happily is not. So there was a lot to be said for it. Uh, but there's uh, the sense of identity of being here was quite different. I didn't need a visa to enter. I don't stand in long queues, which I have to do now, <laughs> and along with the Somalian refugees trying to explain that they, why they need an asylum, even though I have residential status in the in the country. That's right. Still, and. Uh, I do have the same, but I have to get to an officer to show that I have a residential status. Unlike in America, by the way, where I also have residential status since I have two jobs I teach at Harvard, I have a Trinity connection also. Um, there, of course, uh, are the same residential right. I happen to get a, 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 a global entry. It takes me nine, nine seconds to enter. Britain does not do that. Now, there is, a, there is a sense of alienation that is brought in. Oddly, because I still have vote, British voting rights, because I'm sufficiently in Britain mm. through the year to, to keep that, and yet uh, entering is such a big problem. So we have to think about how these violations of certain types of... I have a strong identity of having been a British academic, yeah. but it, it, if that denies there's something, then I have a three point, and I would say, in order to battle the single identity, you have to bring in the multiple identities, saying you are also this, you are also yeah. that. You have to, you know, you could classify people in all kinds of different ways, uh, you know, which are, which are very strong. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, for example, my late wife was, uh, you know, Italian, but I was also Jewish. Yeah. Now she was very much uh, n not a Zionist, but very keen on integration of Jews with the, with the West. But on the other hand, uh, if she sense someone being anti-Semitic, suddenly a personality of her would come out, yeah. which would be quite different from the, the other, because there you are in the defensive. Yeah. I think in some ways, the single identity is often an ally when you are in a weak position. It's a very big thing yeah. for Dalits, for the untouchables. It can be a very big thing for women, too, when, when they are discriminated. It's not the same. When you, when you say, when a majority community member said, well, you give this to, the, to, the, to this to the Muslims, you're quoting the Muslim vote, but on the other hand, why, don't you, yeah. why do you blame us for quoting the Hindu vote by uh, you know, having a picture of the cow being caressed by a woman, as has happened in Bihar election right now? Is but right? I said, there, isn't <laughs> there is an asymmetry there. So identity is a multiple complex issue. But how do you build as human beings, as educators, as politicians, as, as human beings, how do you build um, a stronger understanding of the multiple identity? How would you go about counteracting 
But you know, I think uh, it's, uh, you know, it's not like mu multiple personality. People describe themselves in all kinds of ways, you know, that's standard. I mean, people were I was having but a debate. What I'm asking is how, how you foster that richer description of people. By discussing what they are. I mean, let me take an, an identity which is very important for me, because I had cancer when I was young. And, and but that way, by the way, that's quite a strong an identity too. Mm. I was 18, mm. but also one without it was in my mouth. I can't eat hot food at all, no chili, which in India, of course, you know, India is characterized deprivation. Right? Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> deprivation. But then I like to make the point that India had no chili until the Portuguese bought it in 16 centuries, <laughs> <laughs> which allows me to become a xenophobic nationalist sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, don't don't give me the foreign type food. I want genuine Indian food, no chili in it. <laughs> <laughs> Not spoiled by European imperialism. <laughs> so I think you build in multiple identities, relevant of it where you can. Actually, one way you do it is actually to tell jokes and anecdotes like that, and people understand well, the richness. The only room in which to this in this age group doesn't probably mean anything. This is the, I think it you're referring to, I, 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 I've forgotten that. I, did I have a comment praising Jay Rubin arriving oh, in funny clothes? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this was because I love that because there was an un American activities hearing going on, and suspected communists were un being unearthed from every, every home, as it were. Mm -hmm. And they were all tremendously in danger. And there were big fights, serious fights going on. But I think the ultimate undermining was when Jerry Rubin arrived uh, in, in, a, in a clown's dress. Yeah. And, and that kind of, but there's nothing to stop you from doing it. So it undermined the dignity of the court tremendously. And ultimately, that played a huge part. I think I also they said that. Uh, like, like, how many people have heard of Jerry Rubin? There's no. <laughs> They have just hard because you said so. But there's a no. big, uh, <laughs> there's a big, he was a sort of a leader of the yippies in the 60s and uh, 70s. Yeah. And um, it was a, a, ki a kind of uh, anarcho challenge, uh, anti authoritarian movement. And he was called up in front, as uh, Amartya describes this story in the book. He was called up in front of the, uh, the Un American Activities Committee of the House in, in the United yeah. States. And he went one of the th he, he went in a different costume <laughs> every day. Yeah, but a different one fancy dress. But one know. of them was Paul Revere, which of course really upset <laughs> the. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. the, we, um, uh, very quickly, Marsh, because there are other things we should talk about. But you speak um, about the weakness of will, oh, yeah, and you tell thing. you tell it, it's a different thing, but it, it's also something about the complexity of who we are and yeah. being sort of different kind, at least different kinds of aspects to ourselves, perhaps even different personalities. And um, you talk about the compulsive gambler, and you suggest, this is very politically incorrect, you, because, but, it, but it's a quote from the gambler, so it's not from Archer. Right? <laughs> he says, my mother-in-law hates me, my wife pushes me away. And you suggest that this is the first joke about mothers-in-law. It's from Vedas, 1500 BC. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but it's about the, the, the gambler is ruining his weakness. So he knows he's got a weakness. He knows he's got the, he knows about the problem, but he can't, uh, can't control stop. it. Can't stop. Yeah. And he knows what it, he knows that it's destructive. Yeah. But he can't stop. Yeah. And there's so many things about us. Uh, and we all see these kinds of things. You can call it a lower self and a higher self. Thinking fast, thinking slow. But um, you say that this is a subject that's very important in contemporary philosophy. Aquasia, yeah. Yeah. Could you could you say a little? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a, the, the Aquasia, the Greeks discussed it a lot. Though the first reference, I believe, is that. That was before any of the Greeks discussed it, 1500 BC, uh, in the Vedas. Uh, the Aquasia problem is that you know something is not good for you, but you do it. Uh, because, uh, you know, you, you want to taste a bit of the peanut, and if you have a few peanuts, you can't resist further peanuts. You know it's a bad thing to do. You would not, and you continue to do it because, uh, and I'm doing wrong. Why are you doing it? And well, because uh, it's the, there and so on. Uh, that, what kind of a problem is it? So there's a huge literature for those, the, the probably philosophers here, um, 
Uh, the, the best writing on that, I think, is Donald Davidson on, on the weakness of will. Very, very good, uh, very classic problem. Now, Vedas was an example of that, and the Greek discussed it a lot about how this is one of the major issues of, uh, the, uh, of, of, of being, uh, being and remaining good. There are, of course, um, I mean, peculiar examples. I like Davidson's example as a weakness of will, not any kind of very great things like uh, not drinking too much, not smoking, and so forth. But he says he comes back um, very exhausted and rather drunk from a party, and he jumps into bed and very sleepy and feels that any moment he'll fall asleep. Then he decides, oh gosh, I forgot to brush my teeth. So he gets up, and he's been so well trained that he can't go to sleep without brushing his teeth. And then he says, I go up and brush my teeth, wake myself out completely, and go to bed staring at the stair, staring at the roof, staring at the, at the ceiling, hoping to somehow fall asleep. <laughs> and that he described as a weakness of will, because the right thing to do clearly is go to sleep without <laughs> brushing your teeth. <laughs> so there are all kinds of examples you can construct. Mm. There is a counter argument also, um, by the way, on the, even on that donut question. If you lead a life where there's no weakness of will, you learn a fair amount of spontaneity also. Yeah. I think if you decided not to have donut and always succeed in, I mean, you feel tempted, you would love to have it and never have it, I think there may be a difficulty with you. I, I had a debate <laughs> on that <laughs> subject with Ronald Dwork in, in his, uh, in, in the, I think, Justice for Hedgehogs, I think, his book. So you'd be uptight and boring, in other words? Well, he was phrasing that, and I was he saying was. that, yeah, that you, that spontaneity is also somewhat important. There are important ag arguments on the other side, too. But mm -hmm. I wouldn't put it in the kind of multiple identity category, because these are kind of, <coughs> You know, as if we're fleeting things. You could have the weakness of will and not have the weakness of will. Mm. Uh, and and same person may sometimes fall for temptation, other times not. Yeah. And you could, but uh, that's not the kind of reason for which I thought multiple identity is the best way of thinking of it. Here, the fragility of your thought is a very important thing, I think. But it, it also undermines a lot of the ways in which we uh, do economics, where people have a clear view of their own utility, and they pursue it. So which person is it? The one who eats the donut, or the one who <laughs> yeah. resolves not right. to? It gives you a very different view of what the welfare of that person is. Yes, indeed. Uh, it, uh, I remember reading uh, the classic book of uh, Figu on economics of welfare, 1920. Mm. Lots of very interesting. One of the earliest discussions of the environmental hazards too. Yep. But uh, there he said that for most cases, what people are when people are guided by what would they would like to do, yeah. it's also something which they would like after they have done it. <laughs> but <laughs> he said in most cases there are exceptions. The exceptions are the right. ones we are talking about here. He was a very deep person, wasn't he? Oh, very deep. Yeah. Yeah. And his distinction between private and social cost is one of the most important remarks in economics. Right? Oh, yes. yeah. Yeah. Now, the, turning to something else. Also, I can tell you, since e the definition of economics, we used to debate because Lionel Robbins, who, by the way, was a great economist too, mm. but he had this definition of, of the economics is about, uh, what's it, allocating scarce, scarce means to alternative ends. Yeah. And, and uh, and it's also slightly peculiar because this was done at the time of peak of the Great Depression and unemployment. So there were certain means of production that were not scarce at all. They were actually looking for jobs. Uh, but Figur's definition is the economics of the subject which is concerned with uh, mean streets and hollowed lives, which is, I think, a pretty good definition of yeah, yeah. <laughs> economics. The, um, wh where does that, I, I didn't know that one. Wh where is that? I'll send you a quote, I can't. Okay. Right now. I okay. co I quoted By now, that. somebody will have I, uh, I, I quoted somewhere. Googled I, it, yeah? I quoted somewhere, I know. Okay. <laughs> so, um, let me ask something very different. Um, <coughs> thinking about the 13 essays here, 
and thinking about your books over the last 30 or 40 years, they go back longer than that. So uh, I'm choosing a little carefully in saying 30 or 35 years. The, the issues that you feel should guide how we understand good or bad, how we understand policy, have been around words which you always give a precise meaning to, um, freedom, uh, capability, justice, human development, deprivation. Um, these are the kinds of words which appear in the titles of your essays, appear in the titles of your books, run as strong themes through this, this book um, also. Now, of course you use the language of poverty and inequality, <coughs> but it seems to me to be less prominent, particularly over the, the more recent decades, than it is in the work of other people. Um, and I wondered if you, you know, I find, I must say personally, the language of, of you know, development of freedom, the idea of justice, just to take two of your books, enormously deep and helpful in thinking about policy and uh, ideas. But it's a bit different from those who rush straight to putting poverty and inequality right up front as the title and the motivation and the key guy. So I wondered if you could comment on, on that. Uh, have, I over yeah. have I overdone? No, no, you're absolutely right. I think there are three different things uh, you're noting in that. In that. I had not thought about it until you asked the question. But uh, one is that, I mean, I do have a couple of books, Inequality and the title, as it happened, with the same publisher named the OUP. Uh, but they are long ago. <laughs> One was uh, 70, uh, it came out in 73. By the way, Mukulikov gave me less credit. I came here in 71. I gave my inaugural address in 72. But I also gave the Radcliffe lectures mm. in 72. There was a bit of a, so Radcliffe was the guy who partitioned India, yeah. uh, Radcliffe's commission. I was and teaching in Oxford at, at that time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. anyway, when his name and uh, and so I, I um, uh, uh, and, and then uh, uh, there was the next edition of it later, but 97. Uh, and then I, I had another book called Inequality Reexamined. It was 92, I think. But you're right, it's been, been changing. Partly because, and that's the first reason, is that as I got more interested in development problems, mm. it became clear to me that uh, Income inequality is often a, I mean, it's an evil, it's a pretty bad thing, but a lesser evil than the inequality of educational opportunities, yeah. healthcare opportunities, and so on. That's what makes the difference. If I'm comparing India with China, and I'm not comparing in terms of democracy, where I, I believe I'm perfectly happy with, <laughs> with India being a democracy. But in terms of some of the achievements. That's one of the differences between processes and outcomes, I guess. Is that? <laughs> With, without pushing the example too hard, your happiness with Indian democracy is more about processes and outcomes, it seems. Well, uh, some outcomes too, actually, uh, in the sense, <laughs> <laughs> I have to say. Uh, I'm happy that one could write things in the papers without being censored. Uh, uh, of course, often there is a drumming going on against you. Yes. which I've experienced too. Indeed. And there, there are people planted who, who write, and then the social media could absolutely <laughs> demolish you. <laughs> but yeah. but uh, I think, uh, no, I think there's some results also. But if you look in terms of the inequality, poverty, income thing, yeah. China has about the same amount of, uh, same Gini coefficient. Mm. It was thought to be somewhat higher, but I think Zhou and I, Zhou Dwez and I, know, that's probably a mistake because uh, they did it on income, we did an expenditure, and expenditure inequality tend to That's from in the Uncertain Glory book, is it? Yes, Uncertain Glory, the last book, yep. Uncertain Glory, uh, and Uncertain Glory. The, but the, and there are lots of billionaires. Mm. Uh, more Sato Lafitte is drunk in, <coughs> in China than any other country in the world, with the possible exception of France. Uh, there are lots of billionaires. 
And yet, the, 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 I was going to the, tease you about good red, red wine later on, but uh, maybe that'll be my last question. <laughs> well, it's a good note to end on, yeah. but the. Um, but I think the big difference why inequality in the proper space is so important, that if you think of a, a, a person uh, left behind, and I'm delighted that Ambedkar, who was one of the great glories of LSE, is honored here and is being placed in, in, in a way that would be even more prominent. Uh, I mean, if you come from a kind of backward caste, backward income family, et cetera, not just income, all variety of consideration. There's a whole lot of people, for one reason or another, they're not immunized. One third of the population isn't. China, the percentage is close to zero. Yeah. Even Bangladesh, which has lower income, has that population is 4%. Yeah. In India, it's about one third of the population. They have no schools to go to often. There's no hospitals to go to. That's not a position that the Chinese underprivileged typically has. There's some difficulties yeah. in some remote areas, but they're much more the exception rather than the huge rule that the deprived have in India. I think that captures the injustice of the system yeah. much better I, than, I, than the income inequality figure. That, that's one reason. Second reason why I was shifting is that the developing, uh, the, as the the literature on the uh, um, um, the uh, literature on understanding development, not just for underdeveloped countries, but also for rich countries. I think Adam Smith became more and more relevant to me. I mean, he was certainly a strong influence on my thinking. But it's also become clear that why, even though he's a book of wealth of nations, he's constantly talking about deprivation in people's lives. Yes. Yes. And he's talking at one stage why, with the same level of income in a rich country, you might be deprived, not relatively, but absolutely. I mean, his example is that if you're in rich countries where everybody has a linen shirt and wears leather shoes, you may be ashamed to, you may, be, uh, may not be able to come out and join the public discussion without shame feeling that you're, you're, you don't want to show your deprivation. Yeah. And that really means that ultimately what you're worried about is not the income, but, the, but your ability to appear in public without shame. Yeah. And if you are in Bangladesh or India or Kenya or, or, or Zambia, you may be able to come up with that level of income without any difficulty to take part. Yeah. It's if quite close to sort of Peter Townsend's idea of poverty where you can't afford to send a birthday card to a grandchild. Yeah, in fact, uh, my only grumble with Peter Townsend is that he gives not, a, not an iota of credit to Adam Smith. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. There's also, uh, that, uh, it's a link to the third question, and I'll, I'll yeah. just ask one okay. more after that. Yeah. But the third question is around the relationship between investing in people and conventional growth. Yeah. And really, you've, you began to make the case uh, through the examples that you gave for another reason, which is about... Uh, deprivation and participation and who you are and what you're able to do. But it's also the case, as you've argued, that investing in people is a big part of the story of growth, as well as a big part of the story of investing in people, right. which is the right thing anyway. Um, you want me to comment on that? I, I would, because it, it keeps coming, uh, for, it keeps coming back in sort of all kinds of confused ways, in, in my view, not, not from you. Um, and you do take it on in the introduction. There's a very nice introduction to this. Uh, to this book, which you must read, um, actually before or after, doesn't make much difference. You read it before or after you've read the essays, but th th you might get too exhausted if you read the other. <laughs> you better, better read it before. Okay. okay. <laughs> then but you there still have some energy left. <laughs> but there are two, <laughs> there are two or three quite strong pages in the introduction. Uh, not more than that, but they're clear and strong on, on growth and redistribution and. Uh, essentially why you think it's a fake horse race to uh, insist that people go for one or the other, that, or this happens first, or this happens second, or this one's more important than that. You know, if you could, if you could um, say a little bit about that. Yeah, thank you very much. No, it's uh, something, you know, it's, uh, I, can, I can make it autobiographical too, almost. Eh? Before LSE, I, I was teaching at the Delhi School of Economics in the 60s, mm. before I came here 
in 71 or 72. <laughs> but the, um, uh, we were con I was concerned with the fact that the big thing at that, in our, those days, you know, I was raised during the uh, uh, Second World War and so on, was of course Japan's success. Not Japan's behavior in, yeah. in the war, but Japan's success. And there, of course, reading, uh, exciting thing for me was that immediately after the Meiji Restoration in 1868, um, uh, Japanese take a resolve to make the country fully literate. There's a lovely statement, I think, from Hideo Yaki, saying, why are Americans more productive than we Japanese? Why are we so unproductive? And he said, the reason is that the Americans are educated, we are not. So that's the difference. And then within 40 years, they make the country more literate. Yeah. And by 1910, they're publishing more books than any other country in the world, though they're a poor country still. Mm. That is a part of development which was Japan did Europe, in a, over a longer time scale, did. And at that time, Korea was beginning to go ahead, what later would be called the Tigers and so on. The characteristic feature of them, that they were focusing education, focusing state public health care, and free market. That combination, which is a very Adam Smithian combination. Yep. So that sort of was there, and I gave a few lectures on that, then suddenly, Kerala elected the Communist Party in 57, and they were going to go for universal literacy, universal health care. And I took the liberty not only of writing something in the press, but also in the class, arguing that that is going to improve people's lives very dramatically and won't hinder their economic growth, may even help it. I wasn't absolutely certain on that. Yeah. Of course, Kerala immediately have it, life expectancy. You know, it's even now, Kerala's life expectancy is higher than that of China. But it's shot up. On the other hand, Kerala was the third poorest country, say it in India. Several of my colleagues, they, some of them you know, said that I was misleading everyone <laughs> because how could you irresponsibly suggest go for instant education? Mm -hmm. Overlooking a basic economic point, of course, that since uh, India uh, in the cheap labor economy and education and healthcare is is labor intensive, it's a lot easier to uh, cheaper to deliver education and healthcare in India than in a higher wage economy. But there was underlying the sense that if you could uh, bite your uh, teeth and actually go and do it, it would be rewarded with a higher economic growth. Now, throughout the period, I watched with some anxiety as to whether that thinking was right, and, and whether those who were criticizing me, saying that this is an unsustainable part, third poorest, of a list of 25 or so. Mm -hmm. Now, since in the latest national sample survey, the highest per capita <laughs> expenditure of their income, that's the way with low income, uh, in, in India of all states, is care. Uh -huh. Now that transition showed something in that insight being yeah. basically right. And it is a Smithian insight. Yeah. Ultimately, nothing would improve your life as much as building up to use the kind of language which I'm told I made popular, like capability, yeah. not original well, idea you with did. me. Yeah. Yeah. The, that human capability formation is not only good for human life and freedom, yeah. That freedom is terribly important, even for economic success. And that actually, I think, is a very serious economic point. I claim no originality for it. It's a totally yeah. Smithian point. And oddly, their, his followers followed them in a rather different way. Yeah. John Stuart Mill in one direction, I think very strongly influenced, though Smith himself didn't write very much about gender inequality. Uh, 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 Mill put it on the map on the subject of women. Yeah. Marx put it on the map on the on the education thing, talking about infuriating anthropologists by talking about the idiocy of village life, which is very unfair because all he was talking about is not that the village life was bad, but that you know you don't have schools, you can't you know you yeah. don't read a book and so on. Yeah. So basically, that insight has really been one of the. I would say one of the main stream thinking, uh, and 
when I claim to be a mainstream thinker, and when people point out, I try to argue that you were booking, uh, you know, on economics, including the last one, uncertain glory, tries to uh, construct an alternative economics away from mainstream. Now, I claim to be in mainstream. I mean, yeah. there's Smith and Mill and Marx. <laughs> then if I want to say that the market fails, when the collective goods, I quote Paul Simonson from 54, <laughs> Review of Economic Studies. If I want to... You already quoted Pigou on social costs. I and already quoted yeah. Pigou, yeah. yeah. And also, if there's asymmetric information, I quote Kenneth Arrow of 1963, American yeah. Economic Review. So the uncertain glory isn't saying that you need a different kind of economic. Mm. You ought to seriously study the economic that you take. Yeah, we forget a lot. Yeah. The, um, the last question before we throw it open, or perhaps one or two questions around this, is, is about you. And uh, I've already referred... I, I fear it might come to that. No, no, <laughs> this is... <laughs> uh, I, I'm told there's a magazine called OK Magazine. I would, I've never read it, of course. No. And, um, but I'm not going down that route. It's, um, it, it's, it's about what you talk about in, in the book. And, and, you, and you've spoken about it uh, uh, often because it's, it's deep and important and interesting and that is that your quite extraordinary education and background. I mean, I, I described it as privileged and I, I think it actually was privileged but could you I say a little bit... I only English until much later than most yes. people. But could you say a little bit... I went bit to a Bengali medium school. If you call that privilege, most Indians wouldn't regard going to anywhere other than an English medium school now to be privileged at all. But you, ac <laughs> you actually explain in, in, in here as to uh, the nature of the privilege that it was and what the it, what it gave you in, San the fact in that Sanskrit. Sanskrit was my second language for a while. I still uh, profit from it. It's nice to be able to read something and understand it. Could you say and a little bit more about how that defines your identity, how you think? I, it defines your identity. You've got to be very careful given what we already said that one aspect of your. Uh, yeah. One, one, one of my many, many identities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, because uh, first of all, I, and Tagore, I, of course, is, 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 is some lovely material about Tagore in the book, who, yeah. whom you knew, right? Yeah, indeed. He managed to also give my give me my name, uh, uh, and uh, that there I think is would be proved to be false because Amatia means uh, immortal. Uh, and I think that wasn't a great prediction, I think, <laughs> unfortunately. Now, the, um, the, no, the Sanskrit came to me as a, I mean, I initially, I, of course, Bengali was my first language, and a strong Bangladeshi identity, too, since my family was in Dhaka. This, by the way, is a Dhaka University tie. I ought to show that off. Um, the reason I'm not wearing one is I didn't want to divert attention away from the Bengali. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was wearing, hoping, uh, fearing that you would wear it, but <laughs> I misjudged. <laughs> the, um, I, uh, uh, I wanted to do something else. I did some English later, I could manage more or less now. <laughs> but at that time, and since my grandfather was a, was a professor of Sanskrit, it was easy for me to learn that. And uh, it's quite hard work. You get up like four or five in the morning and do these declination tables, falum fale falani, and so on. I mean, it's really quite a bit to learn by heart, but it's doable very easy when you are five and when you are getting up at four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> that neither of those holds now, <laughs> possibly. But I and your first came the classical Sanskrit literature, which I absolutely loved including, I think I discussed this, uh, this flake, uh, Shuddha's flake of little clay cart, Mitchakotika, which is also has a theory of jurisprudence in it, which I actually used in my book, and the idea of justice. So I learned a lot from these classical phrases, and Kalidas, of course, was a great hit with me. But then I went to the epics, which was earlier, not classical Sanskrit, that was earlier epic Sanskrit, and then ultimately the Vedic Sanskrit. Now, Vedas had become a very big thing. Now they, one of the characteristics of Hindu extremism is to make everything to be dependent on Vedas without being able to read any line of it. <laughs> and so you get a picture when there's a lot of things said about Vedas without any idea as to what it contains. It contains some extraordinarily 
interesting work. It had a view of the world which I think is very easy to understand, very early days, 1500 BC. These people have, uh, you know, mostly nomadic people have conquered India. They are recruiting like mad from local. They have destroyed the urban civilization. And they are kind of uh, rather powerful fight, fighting. I would be rather like what would have happened if the, if the, uh, if the Mongolian invaders uh, that came into Europe settled down and formed the upper classes, <laughs> <laughs> which is what's happening. But then they get humanized, and they're trying to theorize like the rest of them. And they think that, oh, gosh, these are very powerful things, like, uh, like um, uh, lightning, like uh, flood, like thunder, like uh, uh, earthquakes. So you have verses about them. Originally, the hypothesis that some uh, supernatural guy is controlling all of them. Now, towards the end, there's a speculation going on. Maybe there's one guy, God, not called that, who is trying to do all these things. So there is a tendency towards monotheism. But there is another tendency, very strong in Vedas, in Song of Creation, uh, as it is sometimes called, Mandala 10. <coughs> very worth reading, where he asks the question, is that the right way of thinking about it? Is there someone who created it? If there was such a person who created it, is he still there? If he's still there, does he remember he created it? And then it ends with a comprehensive speculation saying, perhaps he does. And then the last line says, perhaps he does not. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> 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 and I would not find a similar level of sophisticated uh, adult uh, argument for agnosticism uh, in that until I encountered Buddha, who of course had better argument than that. Yeah. But all these I was getting through Sanskrit. Now, if you tell a, an activist, RSS, you know, a Hindu, a Hindu person, some Hindu, uh, Hindu activist about Vedas having the gambler and the agnosticism. I think they would say that I'm insulting their thing. Yeah. But these are from the Vedas. So the fact that Sanskrit gave me an independent access rather than the chosen verses, which I'm supposed to read, yeah. which is conforms the, it gave me a huge freedom to read what I like. So it's liberating to think rather than a mode of thought. It also, when it became also clear to me that in 6th century BC, Buddha, when he is arguing, he's regarding the sophisticated arguers are not the religious people. The term Hindu hadn't emerged. That, uh, that, uh, that conventional religion, as he calls it. But the serious arguments are the agnostics. And uh, atheist versus agnostic and he's arguing for an agnostic as opposed to atheistic position. And with the two most powerful propositions, which I think, one is to say the reason why we don't, shouldn't go in that direction is not because we can show that there is no such crea creator. That question will never be settled. But secondly, we do not have to either think of or invent a creator in order to determine what is our right conduct. Our uh, ability to do good things should be independent of that. Now, these are actually enormously powerful reads. And I think there's a connection with that agnostic versus in, in Vedas, too. But I think, but then he's trying to say, to, don't spend all your time, the Lokas and Chayavaka, trying to prove God to be non existent, as they were doing, and the powerful creatures with yeah. the Buddha argued. The important thing is what kind of behavior they end up with. And the, these people who are arguing against the existence of God also had a theory saying, look after your own interest, almost rational choice theories of today. Yes. <laughs> look after your own interest, uh, the world would look after themselves. And he's saying that's wrong. Don't spend your time yeah. arguing about God that exists, it doesn't exist. And you spend your time saying what is the right behavior in a society in which you live. And I think these were, to, to me, transforming arguments. And your ability to go into those through the Sanskrit enabled yeah. you to I could think be, about yeah, that. If somebody <laughs> says that, and I, I could 
look up things. Did he tell that? In fact, it's a booty <laughs> or not? <laughs> Very good. And Marjorie, we must let other people have a go. I, 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 I'm being a bit selfish here. Now, I'm going to, um, we've got about just about half an hour. I'll take three questions at a time. And could you keep them, uh, could you keep them short? And could, could you tell us who you are? And I must... There's some various principles of equity, like upstairs and downstairs, and men and women and, and all that. But lady in the front in the hat first. <coughs> yes, it's right here. Thank you. Uh, Naomi Kalagaru. Um, thank you, Amarta, for Hi. another wonderful <laughs> <laughs> presentation. Always absolutely riveting. Thank you. Um, I wonder if I could put to you, supposing the British government and the government's... But this is not the British government. No, no, no. I'm, I'm just wanting to suppose that I am the British government and the European governments asking you, what would you advise with the current situation with all the, um, for lack of a better term, floods of migrants um, making their way towards Europe? Would you have any advice for the British government, the European governments, as... Um, as a man of ethics and a humanitarian man, as a man of economics. And might Rabindranath Tagore's response be the same or different to your own response? Thank you. There's a gentleman just, I'll take three at a time, my dear gentleman just behind you. I'm going to take three from downstairs and then three from upstairs. Uh, I would like to go back to the initial discussion. Can you give your name, I, please? My name is Pranav. My, I would like to go back to the initial discussion over social identity. So my question to you is, do you think India survives because of these multiple overlapping identities is because these give each Indian in some ways a connection with any other d Indian. Okay. And uh, this gentleman right at the back, the T-shirt. Hi, um, my name's Rick. And my question relates to the last one. How big a threat do you think Narendra Modi and Hindutva nationalism has been to this concept of multiple identities in India? And what can be done to mitigate that trend within Indian society. Thank you very much. And I, I will go upstairs afterwards. We'll take these three first. Um, well, two about uh, India, one, one about uh, UK, Europe, migration. Amartya. Yeah. Um, you know, the, I, I'm always um, very happy when people assume that I know answers to questions that I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think it's a difficult problem, I accept that. Uh, I accept that the obligation to see oneself as a human being, identity comes into it. I think it's a strong European identity which says that Europe is only for Europeans and leave everything else out. You see, an identity, if I may use your point to illustrate two things, it was a uniting identity when the European movement came because it was uniting a divisive Europe between Germany, Britain, France, and so on. And it's a, it's a divisive identity in the context of the rest of the world, like most identities are, you know, I mean, one of the, and, and they're always that feature uh, the, uh, that it depends on how big the unit you are considering. I'm very keen on people thinking about their obligation to the world and not just their, to their own country. I'm also keen on things like uh, the great achievements in European economies, like the welfare state survived. And the attacks doesn't come only from that. It comes from all kinds of angles. But it is possible to take the view that it would be unviable to have if we had open door policy you couldn't really have a national service because you couldn't afford it. Uh, that's not a silly argument. I don't quite know what kind of compromise thing it would be. I, I think I would certainly say I would be inclined to go much more in that direction, partly because some of the conflict of interest that is stated is, doesn't there. I, I think Germany will benefit greatly from the larger number they're accepting to take and particularly since they are going to be relatively more skilled rather than the people who are the really unskilled, who are really stuck there, who are not in a position to move. I think there's, uh, I'm certainly not going to say whether I will do the same as the UK government. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what I, you know. I, I, I would like to see more recognition of one's global identity. 
I would like to see more thinking as to why is it we can't take more? And why is it why we should take as many as we could, which may be more than what it is now? I think that was the problem. This is a complex problem. When, it, when we had to deal with the European economic policy, I could say I think that it's comprehensively wrong, because I can't see any argument for, uh, I don't also, by the way, see any argument for having a euro anyway. Doing, <laughs> doing. No, we bet we better not go. Uh, what about India, though? <laughs> doing the currency yeah. unity before political and fiscal unity, but in this case, I think there are considerations on different sides, and so I have to leave it there because I don't, you know, uh, I don't, uh, don't think that I could give you an answer which would be satisfactory for you, or satisfactory for me tomorrow morning. Okay. <laughs> Uh, which second thing worries me very much. Uh, now the um, and Narendra Modi will be with us in the UK next week, as you know. Uh, yeah, that I come to Mr. Narendra Modi <coughs> last. This is not because he's not my favourite, but but uh, that's the order in which the question came. I think. Now then the um, uh, then the, that was India survived. Yeah, you know, India uh, the. Multiple identity is the way of stating it is the characteristic of an individual. To recognize people's multiple identity is a, could be a characteristic of politics and the state. So if you recognize people's multiple identities, you could say that a person could eat beef and still be a loyal Indian and be Muslim and be <laughs> loyal Indian. After all, the Indian idea of secularism is deeply parasitic on the theorizing that a Muslim king, namely Akbar, did in 1590 about that, multi that, uh, that secularism is not to deny religion everywhere, but not to privilege any member of any religious community compared with another. Now, if that is a tolerance of multiple identity, uh, more than that, tolerance is not adequate. It is actually celebration of the variety, then there's a great danger if that's denied. And the intolerance we're dealing with is not only an ethical failure, but it's also an epistemic failure. It's, it's not describing people correctly. Because ultimately, so many of the ethical issues depend ultimately on description. I mean, and to quote from uh, <laughs> Jesus and Bible, for example, uh, when Jesus is discussing the issue of the Good Samaritan, the argument never takes the form of saying when the Samaritan helps who is not from locality, comes from elsewhere, and the locals don't help this wounded guy. And Jesus is asking the lawyer, who, who has just said that our duty is to our neighbor, to which Jesus' question is, if the, when this wounded man comes to his senses, this is in Luke, by the way, uh, he asked the question, who is your neighbor? What do you think he would think? And the lawyer said, well, I suppose he would imagine, he would tend to think that the person who helped him was his neighbor. And he a stop there. There's no ethical conclusion on that. But of course, his ethics is quite clear. So it's, it's at one level an epistemic argument, who is your neighbor? Another level, ethical argument. It's similarly, who is an Indian, not the one who recite the Vedas without knowing anything about it, and they don't recite the Vedas, swears by the Vedas without knowing anything at all about it, but also people who happen to have that identity of being an Indian, attach importance to it politically, it regards it in many contexts as being more prior than their religious identity, it doesn't prevent them from practicing any kind of religion. That was the point that Akbar made clear in 1595. And Yes, so if that is denied, that the, the, the sustainability of the country is deeply threatened. If that's what you meant, the answer is yes. Now, regarding Narendra Modi, I think, you know, it's, I think generally known that um, I'm not a great fan. Uh, I voted against him. I, uh, I got into embarrassing things because I, you know, in India they put a little, uh, uh, ink on my, and so I, I flew down, I flew 
to vote. I mean, Indian citizens stand in long queues before I enter next country uh, and so on. But I, I flew in from Boston to New York, New York to Delhi, Delhi to Calcutta, and then, then drove to uh, polling booth, to cast my polling booth, and then came back to Calcutta, to Delhi, and, <laughs> and back, to, back to Boston. And I wanted to demonstrate, not that I, I didn't have any illusion that my vote will change anything, but the elections in India take place in stages. And I wanted to show that I wanted to vote, and I was rewarded by saying that a lot of newspapers um, had me on the front page. Uh, what I, and uh, to indicate that I, uh, and indeed saying that I wanted to vote against Mr. Modi. Uh, and uh, uh, um, I think uh, one of the papers attacking me was, I think, unfair in saying that I um, uh, not only criticized Mr. Modi, but also made an obscene gesture. And <laughs> I won't tell you what the obscene gesture might have been that they were referring to <laughs> when I was demonstrating my finger. <laughs> 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 uh, that was undeserved because I wasn't. But uh, I had it done better than I expected. I'm afraid I can't say he has. I did not expect him to be, take a view um, of the question that was asked about understanding the richness of India's multiple identity. I mean, from his childhood, he has been an active uh, Hindu Tapoeva RSS member, in fact. I didn't expect different from that. I didn't expect it to take such naked a form as it has taken. After all, four people now have been killed for eating beef, and a and, uh, lot of people had been uh, given an absolutely hellish time uh, in their lives, and it got the, uh, certainly made the academia feel uh, completely uh, at the mercy of the administration. Uh, and, uh, and um, you know, uh, uh, administrations, um, uh, decisions often gone totally against academic independence. The independent, you know, they replacing the Indian Council of Cultural Relations by a head who believes that Modi is a reincarnation of God. I was about to sue <laughs> this person for insulting, for blasphemy as a loyal reader of the Vedas on grounds that God has to die first before being reincarnated. <laughs> no reincarnation <laughs> without death first. And I was tempted to say that a good Hindu, I'm totally offended <laughs> by the possibility that God can be imagined to have died. But I was resist, uh, resisted from, I didn't know how, what view the court will take of that. Uh, the uh, Indian Council of Historical Research has been replaced by someone who believe that the caste system basically worked very well in India. I think there have been all kinds of ways they have been worse. I didn't expect him to correct the bias of the previous government, which was pretty bad, very bad indeed, in neglecting education and healthcare, because their theory wasn't in that direction. And predictably, they've cut education, they've cut healthcare. What they haven't done is uh, to do anything in, 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 in to remedy that those things. The idea was that some kind of business incentive would make it all up, which I think is a pretty bad theory. But that required quicker uh, licensing, less bureaucracy, less corruption. Unfortunately, that hasn't happened either. So that, in fact, if Modi was elected with a kind of triumphant combination <coughs> of Hindu activists on one side and gigantic amount of uh, business money on the other, I think we have to see to what, uh, the f former would still survive because he had been quite loyal to them, to the Hindu group. The second, I don't think he has been that loyal. I don't think business community had good reason to find that they have turned the page. I'm one of the, and since I often hear I'm against reform, I've been from the first day very strong on reform, and I believe India needs more reform now. When I was chancellor of Nalanda University, to get something through, you have to pass it in the governing body. Then the Minister of External Affairs, of which we are connect, with which we are connected, 
has to pass it. Just when you're about to implement it, we're told that the Ministry of Education, Human Development people, they have an objection. They answer that. Just when you're going to do, he said the, the law ministry had said that they don't agree with that. And then it soon became clear to me that you need consent of seven different ministries. I can see why a businessman is driven absolutely mad by that. So one doesn't have to be an immensely pro-capitalist right-wing hyena in order to say that India has full of counterproductive regulation which has not gone and has to go. And there's nothing right-wing about that. That is just running an economy sensibly. So I think that hasn't happened. So unfortunately, uh, it's a very difficult uh, uh, thing to give high marks on. You were asking what to do, uh, you know, uh, to raise the state. I mean, that's, I mean, he's coming here. I was asked the question, I'm supposed to go on news night tonight. I was asked the question that, um, is it, uh, should, uh, should he be welcome now? And my answer is yes, of course. He is the prime minister, legitimately elected prime minister of a democratic country. Should be definitely welcome. The issue isn't whether he's welcome or not. I think, uh, first of all, politeness requires that. Right. And second, uh, you know, uh, respect to India also requires that what he be welcome. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. The question is, what question do you put to Modi? If you don't, I mean, the trouble really is that if you are only writing things or saying things which are full of faith, uh, I think, I mean, I, was, I mean, you are creating a condition that is odd. I mean, America had a rule whereby he couldn't go to America, which I think was a mistake anyway. But secondly, after they changed it, welcomed him, garlanded him, then Mr. Obama wrote the piece in the Time magazine on Modi being one of the 50th most powerful person in the world. And that is a piece of as psychophantic uh, <laughs> hagiography that I have seen. Uh, I wrote the corresponding piece to Manmohan Singh in the same Time magazine, <laughs> 50 thing. And I tried not, and he was very old friend, very close friend, even though we disagreed on many things, including particularly in education and healthcare. But of course, I liked him very much. And, but I had to strive hard not to make it a psychophantic hagiography. <laughs> <laughs> but not so. I think that's the issue. When he comes here, for God's sake, welcome him. But the question is, why is this happening? Why is that happening? These questions he can't leave behind and provide a different persona in the world, which is altogether different from the way the country is being treated. So what we need is some verity, some comprehensive consistency. In if, you, if this happened in Britain, you would rise in protest. If there were people tormented because they're eating wrong kind of meat, or if there are people tormented because they're not going to the right kind of religious worship place, uh, or, or, or in, the, in, in case there have been some church burning, if there was some Mosque, yes, there's some mosque burning of Hindu temple burning. You would rise in, you know, assuming you are British, you would rise in protest. And the same thing applies to India. Thank you, Martin. Now, we'll, we will have three questions in the top, but uh, if you could keep them very short. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm being, I'm the offender. No, no, oh. it's uh, the, the lady who's closest to you. Hi, hey, um, I'm Ria, I'm a first year student at LSC. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, I'm also part of the Amartya Sen Club, which is a lot of fun. Oh, I'm, um, I'm very honored. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah, so um, as you probably know, India is going through a period uh, in which the population of the bottom half of the pyramid is really booming. Can you hold it closer? Hmm. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but. More, more than half the population? Yeah. Yeah, no, where the bottom part of the population pyramid is really booming. Yeah. But with the unequal access to education, healthcare, and just opportunities, do you think we will be able to capitalize upon this opportunity, or are we heading for a demographic disaster? Is it a gentleman? Thank you. Gentleman right at the back there. 
Hello, uh, Professor. My name is Amit. Uh, my question is uh, related more to uh, towards uh, patriotism and how that plays an important part as uh, of identity. Because when we define identity, we say that we are from a particular country. But that, how does that affect, say, an uh, economy like India? Thank you. And uh, the lady just, just here, striving for gender equity here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I do have a question on the weakness of um, the will that you were talking about uh, in the beginning. Would you so hold the mic a bit closer? Yes. Do you hear me now? Yes. So on the weakness of the will that we do have, it seems yeah. to me like we are putting quite a challenge to ourselves with this weakness that we do have. And I was wondering um, what implications it has on what we can demand from individuals for what they have to deliver when they enter into um, just relationships with each other when we strive for something such as th that should become near to a just world order. Thank you. Uh, Amartya, we've only got f five minutes for three <laughs> <laughs> three very big questions. So very if, big if question. you could bear that in yeah. mind. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think the short answer to the first question is that uh, what, the, what makes the, uh, the situation um, difficult and, and I think you're pointing to the kind of somewhat mindless uh, reiteration of India's demographic advantage of having young people, uneducated, unhealthy young people. Uh, and what you're saying that that may not be such a privilege anyway. But I don't, the only, I, mean, I agree with that totally, but what I don't agree with is that we have to judge about what it does to economic growth or anything like that. It's wonderful that economic growth is positively affected, as just now illustrated by Kerala, by education and health care. But the argument for education and health care is for human beings to lead a decent life, not to be confined to, uh, you know, a, you have to find out what somebody uh, talks about. Uh, uh, and rather than read a story to be read, these ethics which I've loved reading, most uh, uh, people in India being illiterate had over the uh, centuries have heard them rather than read them, which is a deprivation to render. Ultimately, that is uh, to keep people in a country in that position and say, when we are very rich, we are going to do all the, all the education and healthcare, which is so called two-stage development. I think that's a dreadful way of proceeding in economic policy making. So that's the first thing. Now, given the time, I'll stop there. Uh, patriotism depends on, there's some context in which patriotism is really important. I mean, if you are fighting a war, uh, you need some patriotism to be able to sacrifice your life and go into a really, um, into, very difficult situation for yourself, and patriotism helps. At the same time, even in a war, I think best brought out by Wilfred Owen's poetry, dealing with the First World War when he went as soldier, and he died actually. He died, by the way, with the book of Tagore, Gitanjali, in his pocket. Mm. Uh, and that, um, uh, where he's saying that, you know, even where he's fighting, fighting the Germans, that's not, uh, that's not a glorification of Britain against Germany that he wants. So there's a different thing. I mean, if you're fighting a war, and if you have to win the war, and I think to some extent the Second World War was of that kind, it was very important to defeat Nazism and, and, uh, and fascism. And so patriotism has a part to play. I think, you see, in the Indian context, and I see that you're in Indian or look like South Asian, let's say, maybe, 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 uh, maybe Bangladeshi, but I don't know, <laughs> or Pakistani, but possibly Indian. The, it depends on the larger, you know, it's like what we said about Europe. In the context of the Hindu-Muslim divide or Hindu to extremism, being patriotic Indian is a very positive thing to say that, look, I, I, I'm a patriotic Indian and I would not allow you to treat another citizen 
a Muslim as it happened, though I'm a Hindu, I would not allow you to do it. My, it offends my patriotism. That's a very good use of patriotism. On the other hand, to you know, worry uh, about whether you can win the next war with Pakistan or, uh, or do the bed for another country and keep on producing nuclear bombs which might come to destroy yourself uh, at some day is, is not a good use of patriotism, not only morally but prudentially. Given the <coughs> nuclear race, the safest country to be in the South Asia, South Asia is Bangladesh because it does not have a nuclear bomb. No one is going to do a preemptive strike to take out your nuclear bomb. So it's not only morally wrong, but it's potentially a disaster. So patriotism has also that very negative feature. Now, the, um, I'm not sure I fully understood the weakness of will question. Um, were you concerned that even if you have an understanding of other people like the refugees thing, they are, your weakness of will may prevent you from carrying it out? Is that the, what you were saying? Or did you understand it better? No, but could you, would you, if you could very quickly clarify, it's a lady right at the front, is there a mic anywhere near? No, I think the weakness of will came from there. Then no, no, is it, is it, is it, it's this lady right at the front here. Oh, yes, my, yeah. Uh, upstairs. Yeah. Sorry? No, you, you have to be very quick, but, but you... Very quick and in one syllable. <laughs> That's a hard task. Uh, no, so my question was, um, even if we find principles that might guide individuals in acting so that this might bring up just relationships between individuals that are necessary, um, those seem to be very constrained by the weakness of the will because this might affect the human behavior a lot. So that was my question. So it's not that different from what I would yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. That's what yeah. you said. Yeah, yeah. 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 so I, I, yeah, I think I... Think yeah, I right. like the, I think both the one syllabic version as well as multiple syllabic version. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree with that. I think that is a problem. So it's not, uh, when I was answering the first question, it's not just the question of developing that sense of global, uh, uh, global identity, but also to recognize that it requires, it's like price of liberty being eternal vigilance, some of it could be self-vigilant, uh, that you, you bear that in mind in, uh, in, in that context. The fragility is a very big thing. You know, I saw, when I saw the riots developing, the Hindu-Muslim riot, you first hear a story, and suddenly you find people have become unrecognizably different. And the, when they would say, well, there was a lot of Hindus killed there, but <coughs> some of the other side also got killed, as if that made it better rather than worse. So people from whom you did not expect that. In the Bangladeshi context, the transition from a general Bengali identity to suddenly an Islamic identity, Muslim identity, then a move again back to a Bengali identity, yeah. happened rapidly. And so all of these have had a fragility feature. Unfortunately, the, uh, some of the great things also had fragility. But some of the bad things have fragility too, which is yeah. why the answer to uh, Nick's question, we come back where we began, the multiple identity is a good weapon. Because those, even those who are, I mean, even take the uh, very devoted Hindu activists uh, getting seriously offended by somebody eating wrong kind of meat, that is not as stable as hard, if, uh, hard word a situation as you, as you think. So the weakness of will applies to bad will as well. And it's very important to recognize that um, people can change their mind. When you uh, arrive at a very good thing, but your behavior doesn't match it, it's a weakness of will in the classic Aquarius sense. But there is a counterpart to that, which is the weakness of evil belief. I think it's difficult to think today that in this country, when I first came here, I think anti-German jokes were extremely common. In yes, fact, yes. very easy to say that in a in a meeting, which in a way, that not only it's not possible to say now, but I don't think it would occur to people to say it. 
it, it, that, I think, is, is, is very important to recognize. It's, I think, ultimately, it's tribute to human, both reason and human sentiment. And that's why I like the title of Theory of Moral Sentiment. He's mentioning that underlying that, Adam Smith, yeah. unlike Hume, David Hume, Smith is taking the position that your sin sentiments are also mediated by your reason. But sentiments are very important too. Thank you, Anakshya. Before we thank Amartya in the proper way, um, there is a book signing. In order for this to happen uh, effectively, could I ask you to please stay in your seat so that Amartya can get down to where the books are? Otherwise, the whole thing will uh, never happen. <laughs> but be before you stay in your seat... I think seat there's some point in being made. Ah, the books, the signing is here. So well, thank you. I'm asking you. you all to clear out. No, so <laughs> you, <laughs> you than stay on. <laughs> let, let, let me let me recap and thank you for the clarification. Um, you don't, you, they don't you, have you, to do anything, no, no, do they? They do. No, they go out in a seemly manner, <laughs> and they buy a book, <laughs> and they come back in line, and you will sign it. But before okay. we do that, let's all close. <laughs>